one down here in our chapel, which is that building on the other end of the parking lot from the church. When you leave here, you'll look out the doors and you'll see it. And this is an incredible place to do a wedding. This is where I got married, and this is where many friends have gotten married. Um, and if you are going to plan or book a wedding November through April, at some point in there, you are having your wedding, we give discounted rates because it's the off season. So make sure to contact Betty at 242-7970. Dude, it's all right. We just moved Saturday night service to Sunday night. You'll be all right. Oh, and the clothes, those are mine. We got a date later.
Awesome. Um, just so you guys know, um, we have an awesome video team. Go ahead and give it up for the video team, please, because those were some sweet videos. Um, Nate is out of town this week, so we have a very special guest speaker. You might recognize her from doing what I just did here a little while ago. Her name is Sarah Allen. She has an awesome message for you guys tonight, so if you go and give it up to her and then give her your full attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Oh, we have to start off on a sad note tonight because I'm not positive, but I think that might have been the last of the bear videos for the summer. But he went out with a bang on the Colorado Mesa University campus. I've got to try to get that straight. As of today, we can't call it Mesa State anymore. So if there's any Colorado Mesa University guys back in town, we want to welcome you back. We're excited to have you. Um, trying to get used to that name change, so you've got to keep saying it over and over. But... Um, I actually wish, I wish they had consulted me. I want to like start a little write-in campaign because I think that they should have, with the name change, they should have changed the mascot to the emu because it would have been super cool to be the Simu emus, I think. <laughs> it, you know, I work in marketing. They didn't hire us for that. That's probably the reason, so. Uh, but yeah, my name's Sarah. If this is your first time, um, obviously I am not the pastor here. That would be Nate Ralston, and he's enjoying a week away with his wife and family, just getting a little bit of rest. We hope he, they're having a really good time. And so I just get to sub in every once in a while, um, and this is what I think is one of the cool parts of Kalea. You know, every week a service host like Coulter gets up here and says um, that Kalea is a Greek word, it means to be called, and that we really believe that we're all call called to be a part of the ministry of Jesus here. And so I'm a volunteer here. I, I don't work here at the church. You know, I work in the business world, and, um, and this is one of the cool things that they kind of put their, the, their money where the mouth is, you know, um, here at Kalea with the leadership team. And they let people like us um, come and try out things that we're interested in. And I love to teach. I've only done it a few times. So you guys are totally the guinea pig. And you can blame Nate for that. But uh, we've been going through the book of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, your iPads, um, I'm still running on classic paper up here. But you guys all have your iPhones and all that stuff. If you want to get out uh, to Luke chapter 6. And we've got a ton of material to run through. So I've kind of got a hustle tonight. Um, but first off, I would just love to start by praying if we could. Father God, thank you for tonight and for this opportunity. Um, I just pray that, Holy Spirit, that you would come and just completely speak through me and that you would prepare all of our hearts to hear everything that you have to teach us tonight. Make your word clear and um, just do all that you desire to do. Convict us and, um, and build us up and encourage us and just show us what it is that you have for us to learn. May this all be to your glory and in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we've been going through the book of Luke for a lot of the summer now, actually, and Nate's been taking us through it, and we've been asking two questions as we go through this. Who is Jesus, and what is his ministry? And just to recap a little bit, last week, if you weren't here, just a refresher, um, Nate talked about uh, the section just before what we're going to read, uh, where Jesus selects his 12 apostles. And he talked about, you know, these were guys that... Um, you know, if like when you're picking a team in gym class, you always pick like the most awesome kids, right? Like you pick like, if you're playing kickball, you're picking like every soccer team player in that, in that room. And you're picking like all the cool kids or whatever, the athletic kids and, and the gym teachers always kind of put a stop to that so that you couldn't. But you would think, you know, if you were, if you were uh, doing this in a worldly manner with a worldly mind, you would pick, you know, all these top like wealthy guys, these guys that own businesses, these guys that had power, maybe like the mayor of Jerusalem, I don't know if they had mayors then. But you know, you would pick like all these like top level guys according to you know what we think that is. But Nate just talked about who these guys were a little bit and, um, and these, you know, we know six of them were fishermen, they were just working class, regular guys. Um, some of them we don't even know what they did, but they're all, you know, just regular guys, um, illiterate, they were probably not educated really at all. And um, he said, hey, come follow me, and you're going to be the foundation that the church starts with. And, you know, it's why we can be here in church today. It's awesome. So these people, uh, we're going to be in uh, chapter 6, verse 20, but just to kind of set the scene for you, because this gets to one of Jesus' huge sermons. Now, there's debate whether this is the Sermon on the Mount or a different sermon, but it's got a lot of the similar material to anywhere else in, in the other Gospels. But we do know thousands of people, crowds, came to see Jesus. And you got to think about this a little bit to like set the scene because these people, they didn't hop in the car and go down and see Jesus. You know, they were walking. And some of them walked, you know, a few days to go and see him. They traveled long distances, which means they had to have heard about him. You know, they heard about him from word of mouth. I mean, word was spreading fast about this guy. And they were curious enough to pack it up, you know, and their, their eight kids and, you know, how road trips are. Now imagine walking with all your kids and going to see 
Jesus um, in, this, in this area. And um, the, these towns nearby, just to put it a little bit more in perspective, and I heard another pastor talk on this and I loved it. It puts it into perspective. These towns were like 50 to 100 people, maybe a few thousand at most. So you're talking when thousands of people came to see Jesus, like it literally drained some of the towns. There was no one around, just crickets, you know, because they all came, they all came to see Jesus, and that is a big deal. So thousands, you know, meant a lot. I'm, I'm from Wyoming. We've got towns of 50 to 100 people. I get it. And they would have been empty because everybody's going to see him and to hear this, this sermon that he's about to teach that we're going to be in for several weeks. Um, so this would have been really unusual at the time, and of course he had to speak outside because it was the only place that would accommodate all these people. You know, there's no Red Rocks amphitheater or anything at the time, so he had to find, you know, some terrain that would suit well that he could kind of get up and his voice would be able to project out to thousands of people. I mean, there's, I don't know, I'm a bad judge, but maybe 100, 150 people in here, and you know, we've got to use a mic, and he has to project his voice out to that many people. And just like the disciples, most of these people, they were working class, they would have been illiterate. Um, just kind of gives you an idea of, of who we're talking to here. Um, so we're going to get into Luke 6, verse 20, and I'm just going to read through this. Uh, go through the first few verses here first. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. I just want to take just a second there. We're going to read the rest of that section, but um, I just want to take a second there just to talk about what this is not saying because um, it, some of your guys' little... Um, little titles and things in your Bible, they'll tell you that these are the Beatitudes and you can see them in other Gospels. This is a section of scripture that gets taken out of context a lot. Um, when it talks about um, blessed are the poor and blessed are the hungry, you get what is kind of referred to as the poverty gospel. And so if you've had some teaching on this, I just want to take a second to clarify it because I've heard it this way, that, it, that there's people that believe in this poverty gospel that you have to be poor, you have to be hungry, and that is who God blesses. And so you should sell all your stuff, go live in a house, and you know, wear like one set of clothes, and then God will love you, God will bless you. And that's not at all what this is talking about. Uh, but this has gained some traction. I mean, it's popular um, a lot in um, some of the Catholic church, you, you'll see this, and then in the postmodern or emergent church movement, you're gonna see this. Um, I've read a book by a guy, there's more than one, but um, you know, he, he sold all his stuff, he went and moved into the city, and he um, got a whole bunch, they lived, you know, in a community in, in, in this one house, and they just lived off of, like, the little garden that they could grow and what they could scrimp together. And that is awesome. If God calls you to do that or to do a certain thing, to go reach certain people, then that is awesome. But it is not, this isn't the text where you have to follow it in order to be blessed or to be rewarded by God. Um, that's just completely taken out of the context. And I always think that that's kind of funny because it's like, okay, so... Um, I have to be poor in order for God to bless me or reward me. So, well, which poor do you, do you choose? You know, is it the American version of poor? Or is it like the Ugandan version of poor? Because I've been to Uganda a couple times, and poor there is nothing like poor here. Poor here is super rich compared to poor there. So, which poor is it that Jesus, you know, blesses? Which, which country's version of poor do you choose? You know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work up with the logic, but... I just wanted to clear that up because there's been a lot of teaching on that. So let's move on and read the rest of this section, and then we're going to go back and talk about it. So verse 24, But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. So what we have here, we had the first little section of this talking about those who are blessed. And then this, this section that I just read is a point-by-point -point counterpart of that. And it's this profile of people that have no blessing. They've got no blessing coming their way. But why is that? And it's because their comfort, it's in their stuff. If you look here, woe to you who are rich, you've already received your comfort. You know, their comfort 
is in what they have around them, their wealth, their stuff, their position, their status, their title at work, whatever. They can wrap all that stuff around them like this cozy blanket, and they think, I don't need anything. I've got it. Here it is. I'm comfortable. Why, do I, why would I need Jesus? Why would I need this God you're talking about? And we're going to come back to that and talk about that a little more in just a second. But you go up to verse 20 through 26, and it's describing those that are blessed. Well, why are they blessed? It's not why we just talked about, because they're poor, because of their circumstances. But it's that in those circumstances, that's when we realize that we don't have anything. And we don't have anything to offer God. And it's our circumstances that can, can humble us and help us see that we have great need. So think about it. When do people usually cry out to God? Is it right after they won the lottery? I mean, maybe because they're like, probably using his name in vain. But, you know, it's when, I mean, you've lost your job. You don't know how you're going to make the next mortgage payment. You don't know how you're going to feed your kids next. You don't know how they're going to buy their school supplies. There could be some people right now going through that. We're in a tough economy right now. I've been watching the stock market just, just rocket down every single day. Big red arrow. But those are the situations where you find people more apt to cry out to God. They've been humbled. It's hard to stay proud. It's hard to stay tough and proud and strong. And I don't need anything when you really need a lot. So we find in this that it's humility that allows the blessing. It's the humble that will see their identity is in Christ. You know, when the circumstances are tough and all that stuff's happening to you, it's the humble that'll see that their hope is in the Lord. That they don't have hope in anything else. They can't put hope in their bank account right now, especially when it just flatlined. You know, they, can't, they can't put hope in anything else. It's also when you'll see that you need Jesus for your peace. You know, the world can be crumbling down around you, but when your identity is in Christ, you can have a total peace that is calm. I've, I've had that a couple times in some crazy experiences, and I had people in my family that thought I was weird because I wasn't freaking out, and I should have been freaking out, but it's only because if you can take a step back and go, okay, but my hope is in the Lord. My peace comes from him regardless of what's going on around me. These kind of people that are humble and whose identity is in the Lord also see that the, he's the only place that they can have joy. I mean, that might be eating um, saltine crackers and they're not college students. It's not normal for them to do that. And they can still have joy in the Lord because it surpasses all the rest of that stuff, all the circumstances. And so we go back down to the next section which talks about all these woes. We don't say the word woe. Nobody goes, woe to you for you know, firing me or whatever. Uh, we just don't talk like that. It just means incredible despair. And so this next section, it, it's talking about woe to you. Well, why? Woe to you if your identity is in your lifestyle. So we just talked about identity in Christ. Let's talk about having identity in your lifestyle. We can do it as Christians. We can do it. It's good to check ourselves all the time. That's why we're talking about it. We can put our identity in, um, you know, any of our, our money, our resources, our job, our title, stuff, toys, your reputation. How about that one? We, um, we are all about our reputation right now. If you look at social media, and I'm going to pick on Facebook, and I don't have a problem with social media. I have Facebook and Twitter and a blog, and back when MySpace was cool, if you can imagine that I had a MySpace account. I mean, it's not a big deal, but we need to look at how we're using these things, because I really think now, if you, if you think about it, we really curate and, and build our identities online. You know, we put our best selves out there. We can post whatever photos we want. We can post anything we want about what we're doing. You post about your job on there. I mean, it knows everything. I had somebody email me today, and it turns out that I can see all of my friends' cell phone numbers if they want me to see them or not. I have no idea how. Facebook runs the world. I think I've figured out finally. And it's crazy, but we can put all this stuff out there, but you never put your big faux pas out there, do you? You don't write that as your status update. Unless it can be funny, and like, then, you know, people will comment on it and laugh with you and that kind of thing. But 
you just you build and build and build your best self on there. And because I'm a geek, I always have numbers from a study because I love these things. And I read this stuff and, um, for my job a lot, actually. And I was reading this at work the other day, and it's a study that MTV did um, called Millennials Decoded. And the millennial generation um, is also called Generation Y a lot of the time. That would be most of us probably in this room. I'm 29. I'm in that generation. And they just asked a lot of questions about how these guys were using social media and what were their habits online. And they asked all this so that marketers like me can totally exploit it. But reading this study was really interesting, and actually it, it really made me pretty sad. But just a few things from it. They found that 33% of people always, not sometimes, always modify their pictures before putting them online. So 33% of people take it in their camera, look at it, well, we all do that, you know. Look at it. Oh, no, I look, I look chubby there. We've got to switch over here. Light's better over here. You know, take 30 pictures until you get the one that you want. Then you take it and you put it on your computer and you Photoshop it or do whatever you can to it. Make it look the absolute best that it possibly can and then post it online. And they found that 33% of people our age were doing that all the time. To me, that just sounds like a lot of work, but people are doing it. 58% uh, reported a boost in their confidence when receiving feedback on Facebook. So like comments and likes and stuff, they found that for most people that totally like lifts up their day, you know. And I saw another study that actually they were saying it's a lot like drugs, like it re releases these endorphins and stuff when that happens for people and that little red number thing on Facebook, you know, shows up. It's like this little puff of like crack, you know, <laughs> in your system. And it's crazy, but you know what, it's true, this is what's, what's a big part of our life now. And this was my favorite, this was just um, some comments in the study showed up that people are actually now attending parties and events just for the photos that they can post online later. So think about that the next time you have a birthday party. They're not actually there for you. They just want to post, you know, some pictures online, make it look like I, I've got a social life, I'm in, I'm in the flow, I've got friends, we're hanging out, you know. That's, uh, that one shocked me, that one startled me. But we're doing that, we're, up, we're in there and we're just like building our reputation all the time. What do people think about me? What do I want them to, you know, this is what I look like, this is what I do, like just constantly building it and building it. You can work on it every single day, 24 seven if you want to. And it, and it totally goes back to this, this thing that we have in America called the American dream. It's what we're all born with, we're raised with, you know, you gotta chase the American dream. The American dream's all about pride. I mean, it does not talk about humility and blessed are the poor. We're like, oh, you're poor, get off your butt, go do something. Here's some government programs maybe to get you out the door, but get moving, you know? I mean, it's the thing that we should be chasing the, the, the happiness, the pursuit of happiness, right? You hear that all the time. We should be chasing happiness. And it was so weird on Sunday, right after I finished, I mean, literally right after I finished outlining this message, I was listening to NPR, and they're doing a little story on this guy who was a Christian missionary, and he went to South America to this, you know, remote tribe in the Amazon, and how, um, you know, he went there to share the gospel with them. But his story was about how he left Christianity and he converted to whatever their gods were and stuff because they were just so much happier. They were happier than a lot of Christians he knew. And so he completely abandoned God, completely abandoned Christianity for that. And it broke my heart because if we're chasing happiness, then you know, we're in a bad place. If we're just chasing happiness, then like this says, we have woe coming to us. We have despair, not reward, not blessing. And so to summarize it, in this, in this section, the first part of it talked about those that are blessed, it's the humble, it's those that have their identity in Christ despite their circumstances. Those are the people that are going to have blessing and heavenly reward. So when it gets really tough, when you've, got, when you've lost a job and, and your husband's you know, cheated on you or all the, the horrible things, there's been tragedy in your life, all that crazy stuff that can happen, if your identity is in Christ, you can know that that's about as worse as it's going to get. Like that's as bad as it's going to get because you have a hope and a future and it's in heaven. You have these heavenly rewards that are bigger and greater than we could possibly imagine. And so this life is just this life. It's hard to have that perspective, but it's still just this life. It'll be over. The circumstances will be behind you. And in heaven, there's not even going to be, worry won't exist. Anxiety, fear won't exist. There will be nothing to worry about. Just plain won't exist. 
you're going to have feast, you're going to have joy, you're going to have, you know, more fun, I'm convinced, than we could even conceive right now in our minds. It's going to be just so much better for us that goes on forever and ever that we'll look back on this Kind of like we look back on high school, you know? Like, you know you know, how your problem's really big in high school and, and when you're in it, you're just like, oh, this is the end of the world. He broke up with me and he's talking to Susie now and all that kind of stuff. And it's just awful. It's awful. You can't, ex- it, you can't think outside of that. But then, you know, you get out of college and you get a little bit older and you look back on it and you laugh now. It was a huge deal at the time, but you kind of laugh. And I kind of picture heaven's gonna be like that. Like, we'll get there and even though stuff was seriously really tough here, we'll look back on it and go, oh, I Look at this, like look what I have. I can't believe I worried about that. I had Jesus the whole time. I can't believe I was freaking out about that. So on the other side of it, if our identity is in our lifestyle, that's where we have nothing but earthly reward and pain coming our way. It talks about, you know, woe to you who are rich, who are comfortable, who are well-fed, who are laughing, people love you, you have a great reputation. He's just saying, enjoy that. You'll probably get it if you chase those things. You'll get it to some degree, but you better enjoy whatever you get because that's it. That's what you get. So enjoy your boat or whatever it is because that's it. You better have fun with it. That's all there is. There is no reward or blessing coming after that. There's pain. Who wants that? But we do it. I mean, I do it. I put my identity in things. We've got to check ourselves regularly as Christians. Where is our identity? Well, let's keep moving. Uh, We'll go over to verse 27. I'm just going to read 27 through 36. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. So when you have nothing and someone steals your coat, give them your shirt too. Anybody ever done that? I have not. (laughs) Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. So this whole section kind of seems like it totally switches gears here, but it doesn't. You've got to remember, this is a sermon. Jesus is speaking, one flowing conversation to a bunch of people. You know, it's, in a lot of Bibles, it's split out like it's this whole other section, and that's where sometimes those things are helpful, but sometimes they can confuse us a little bit. But after what we just talked about with all the humility and where our identity is, now Jesus is describing how the kingdom of God works. This is how the kingdom of God works. What, what we just read here, this is Jesus' character, so this is how we should be. And he talks about enemies here, and I like it. It doesn't say, if you have enemies, if you should encounter someone who hates you, it just says, love your enemies. Meaning that if you're a Christian, if you follow Jesus, you're going to have some enemies. There's just going to be some people who hate you. So if you're worried about your reputation, you might as well just accept that right now. There's going to be some people that don't like you. So who is that? Who is your enemy? Some of you, you're going to be able to picture it right away in your head. You can picture a person, you've got a name, you know, everything just flashed into your head of what happened, what they did. These are, these are your enemies, as it's listed here biblically. You know, who, who gossips about you? Um, who hurt you? Who stole something from you? Who cheated on you? A lot of people have been through that. Who takes shots at you at work? What this is saying is don't retaliate, but forgive them. And forgiveness is, is a big thing. We talk about forgiveness. All the Bible talks about forgiveness over and over. That's what Jesus came for. That's what he came to do. That's the purpose. And we tell, forgive, forgive, forgive. You should always forgive. We talk about it a lot, but what is, what is forgiveness? Well, forgiveness, this is the key thing. Forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a choice. 
You know, if you wait around to feel like forgiving somebody, probably for most cases, it's just not going to happen. You know, it, it, it just doesn't work like that. We actually hang on to things. We, we grow them in our hearts. We become more and more bitter. We hate them more. We hang on to we hang on to it more. We refuse to forgive them, and we feel justified in it even. But forgiveness is not an emotion that you have to wait to feel in order to forgive. It's a decision to make. And all you got to do is ask God for the heart to forgive. Even if you're super angry at the time, even if what happened, you know, it was really, really crazy, you just have to ask God for the heart to forgive. That's what we have the Holy Spirit for. And he comes in and makes us able to do what is impossible to do ourselves in our, in our flesh, in this sinful nature that we have that we live in. So you don't retaliate, you forgive them, you pray for them, and you treat them well. Um, I had this experience at work at my old job where um, I, this, I had been there for a few years and this guy came on and um, he was the new guy and he had a lot of experience. He's a great guy, um, really, really knows what he's doing. But he just kind of like, I, I didn't like him. <laughs> I, just, I just did not like him. He rubbed me the wrong way. He was arrogant. He took over in meetings that I was leading. He would just stomp all over. He had to get his way. Um, I didn't like how he treated women in general. I felt like he was kind of just like this egomaniac sometimes. And um, I just didn't like him. And it grated on me. And we'd have to work together at times. And... He would like boss me around, so then I would get mad and be like, who are you to boss me around? You don't know what I do here? You know, I had this total attitude. And um, so I would just make it harder and harder. Every time we would work together, it was like we were fighting. We were just fighting all the time. And I hated it, and I'd go home mad and angry, and I would dread. I would stay up like I couldn't go to sleep. I would dread the next day because, oh, I got a meeting with him, and I know what he's going to do. And so I'd be literally laying in bed thinking of all the things that, like, oh, when he says this, I'm going to say this, and when he does this, I'm going to say this. And, and, and it just grated on me. It drove me crazy. And our bosses, he was kind of like the sibling that, like, slaps you while mom's, you know, behind. And then when she turns around, it's like, hmm, like, I'm so cute, I'm perfect. And so like all of our bosses just loved him and he could just like spew out fairy dust when he talked and everybody was, it was like magical. But so this stuff, you can tell, obviously, I had a total attitude problem with him. And I found myself, just like I said, one night laying in bed, I couldn't go to sleep because I was just like thinking about all this stuff with him and oh, I'm so mad and I'm so sick of it when he does this and here's what I'm gonna do and oh, I hope that, you know, he, he messes up or, you know, just thinking these terrible things. I had this bitterness in my heart. I had not forgiven him for, you know, some of the ways that he treated me that maybe were not fair. And um, it was building and building and building. And I got to the point where I was like, oh my gosh. Like, so now I'm not sleeping because I'm thinking about this? What is this? And God just convicted me and I had to submit it. I just had to let it go. He wasn't changing. God wasn't like, oh, I'll change him for you and then this won't be a problem. He was concerned with my heart. So he convicted me on this, and I submitted it. And I'm not going to tell you that the next day it was all magical because for the next several days, a couple weeks, I had to pray and pray and pray. I had to submit it over and over and over because it would come up again, and I'd start to get that and start to want to poke at him and just kind of, you know, take shots if he took them. And I had to keep submitting it. And this image popped in my head. It's like um, I had to hold it underwater and, and just try to drown this thing out by keep praying, keep submitting, and it was kicking and fighting and trying to come back and trying to come back, and finally, God just released it. It, it. it died, and it went away, and we ended up being great friends. There was, I mean, I went to work the next day, totally different attitude, didn't have a problem since. We ended up, we can hang out now. Um, we spend time together. We work together. We had a great working relationship through the rest of my time there. No problems whatsoever. We came up with great ideas together. He'd come hang out in my office. It was awesome. I truly went from, I can't stand this guy, to I enjoy hanging out with this guy. And it was awesome. It was so great to have that released. But it came down to a choice on my part to do it when God convicted me. So all this talk about forgiving our enemies and praying for them and treating them well, this, this doesn't mean what Jesus is not saying is that there's no justice. You know, if someone breaks into your house and steals everything you have, you call the cops, but you forgive them. So what we do is we let God have the justice. 
It's not ours to go retaliate against, to go try to take back what was ours. We forgive, we let it go, and we let God have it. But there are enemies in this world that we have. I think we do this especially. Um, as Christians, there are just, there's people, there's enemies, there's groups, whatever, that we feel justified in retaliating against and not forgiving. And it's even celebrated sometimes. It's encouraged sometimes. We get this us versus them mentality. And I love it. Last week, um, when Nate was talking, if you're here, he used this word um, or this term problemisms. And I thought that that was great, you know. We, like, looked down, I'm like, oh, they're in that, you know, the alcoholics group, their alcoholism, you know. Oh, they're those guys. Yeah, they really don't have it together, do they? Boy, I'm glad I, you know, I'm, I'm going to Kaleo. I'm not going to that class. Like, we get this attitude with these people, and we're all the same. We call him, you know, his little problemism term was great. We do it with other religions as well. You know, pick any one of them. And yes, it's true, they're following heresy. They're not following the, the one true God that we know to be true because right here in the Bible. But it doesn't mean that we have this us, them, versus, you know, us versus them mentality with them of like, oh, those guys are really, they are a bunch of idiots. I can't believe, do you hear what they believe in? I can't believe they believe in that. They must be really stupid. I mean, you hear, you hear way worse talk than that about people of other religions. When our heart should be broken for them, we should be praying for them, we should be trying to talk to them, trying to minister to them. But we get this like, well, I'm a Christian, I have been chosen, and you are not, and um, you're clearly very messed up. And, and so we fight them, we fight them on things, and we should be coming alongside them, trying to minister to them, pray with them. And I see this, I've got, unfortunately, a great example of this within my family. I have a set of grandparents whom I love like crazy. They're awesome. Um, they're Christians. They, they love to share the gospel with people. I'm thankful for them because they shared about Jesus with my mom, and my mom is the one who talked to me about it uh, from an early age. And so I'm so thankful for them. But they've got a lot of pride. They've got a pride issue. And I've talked to them about this. We've had this discussion, but... So you have my grandparents, and then my mom is one of five kids. One of her sisters, my aunt, she, they all grew up Christians. My aunt um, married a man who was Mormon, and so she converted, converted to Mormonism. And this is 20 years ago. And when that happened, my grandparents stopped talking to her. They completely stopped talking to her, cut her out of their life. And they had scripture to back themselves up. I've seen it. I've talked to them about it. We've had a discussion. They didn't like what I had to say. But they completely took scripture out of context. And, and they were backing themselves up, thinking that God was celebrating them. God was blessing them because they were sticking to their guns, even if it meant cutting their daughter out of their life. And they did. And they did not talk to her. She tried to communicate with them. She tried to send them letters, send them cards. They wouldn't even open them. They re returned to center on it and just put it right back in the mail. And she had a son, my cousin, and he didn't have a relationship then with his grandparents. For most of his, this happened when he was young. He has a set of grandparents that he really doesn't know because they completely cut them out. If we had family get-togethers, they were not welcome. So we had to like hang out with this part of the family here and then we'd have to go and hang out with her, you know, separately. And it's crazy. This is what I've known for most of my life. Well, my aunt contracted uh, hepatitis C. And last year, she died from it. And she had quite a bit of time in the hospital. She had to be life flighted, and she had time in the hospital. And my grandparents, you know, they were filled in on the situation. They were kind of, my mom and, and some of her other siblings were saying, this is your opportunity. And they just said, well, we hope that, tell her that we hope that she dies knowing Jesus. And that was their last message to her. They did not go visit her in the hospital. She passed away. When the funeral came, they did not go to the funeral because they could not be in the same building with a bunch of Mormons. They could not go to a Mormon temple and be in the same building with a bunch of Mormons. It, it infuriates me when I think about it. It is the craziest thing. But it's totally that us versus them mentality. And people find ways to do this, and they find ways to back it up with the Bible. It's awful. These people, we make enemies where we don't 
need to. God said, we're going to have enemies. It's just going to happen. We don't need to make them for ourselves. And so, yeah, she did something they didn't like, but they should have forgiven, prayed, moved on. Who knows what it could have been like had everybody just surrounded her and prayed with her and, and prayed for her and, and supported her and you know, kept her in a loving family. So why should we follow all of this? Let's go back to just these last two verses. These are the key, verses 35 and 36. Love, love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. What we need to see here is that we are the ungrateful and the wicked. You know, Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us came out of the womb awesome. Like, no matter what your t-shirt might say, it didn't happen. It's not true. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all ungrateful. We have no righteousness to offer. We're all the wicked. That's not them. It's us. And by God's grace, we know him now. We have this relationship with Jesus but it is who we are. It's by God's grace that he pursued us. You know, he came after us. There's a verse that says that we love him because he first loved us. He pursued us. And it's by his grace that he loved us unconditionally. And he saved us. He rescued us from the path that we were headed on from our first breath. Um, worship team, if you guys want to Go ahead and come forward. What we need to remember in all of this is that we have no righteousness of our own. We have nothing to offer God. Um, our status with the world doesn't mean anything. You might have six bajillion Facebook friends. You might be Mark Zuckerberg, whatever. It doesn't mean anything. Your new title at work doesn't mean anything. Your 4.0 really doesn't mean anything. It's, it's great that you've accomplished that or done those things, but when you're comparing it to the righteousness of God that we are given through Jesus Christ, it means nothing. Your church attendance doesn't mean anything. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad you're here and that you make a point of it of coming regularly. That's great and we should do that. But if your whole thing is on, well, I go to church all the time and I go to 12 Bible studies and I help out and I serve in all these ways and I give all my money away, you know, it's, if that's what you're looking toward, it's those, those works, those actions to get that reward and to get your righteousness, it doesn't mean anything. But it's by his mercy and grace that we should give mercy and grace. We are those ungrateful and the wicked. So we should give it. It's part of our identity in him and our identity is everything. So this is where we are rewarded. This is where we're blessed. In having his character, in loving what he loves, in forgiving as he forgave, and in treating people as he treated us. So we didn't deserve any of this. So we're going to worship tonight with our awesome worship team. And I just want to... Let's as a group just focus on these two. I just want to ask you two questions to just think about while you're worshiping. One, where is your identity? It's just really good to check in regularly on this. Where is your identity right now? Where are you putting that? And who is it that you need to forgive? When I was talking about that, if a name or a face popped up in your mind, make the decision tonight to forgive them. Ask the Holy Spirit to make you able to do it. I promise that you will. We have an awesome uh, prayer team over here that you guys are completely welcome to use at any time. They love praying with people. Don't be shy, and let's worship God together.